Hello everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Laurel Page, and I am the Assistant Director of Events at the University of Colorado Boulder's LEAD School of Business. Welcome to our eighth webinar series. These continue to be trying times, and here at CU Boulder, we have gathered our world-renowned faculty and alumni to provide frank and timely insights. Today is the second of six webinars in this webinar series. To view upcoming webinars, please visit colorado.edu backslash business backslash alumni. Click the drop down arrow and click attend online webinars. For today's webinar, we're excited to welcome Anna Blankley here presenting self amplifying RNA vaccine for prevention of COVID 19. A few housekeeping items before we begin. First, if you have any questions now or during the presentation that you would like to ask Anna, please send a question through the Q&A interface. We will monitor questions as they are submitted and Anna will respond to them at the end of the presentation. As a reminder for optimum audio quality, we do have everyone on mute except for myself and our speaker. If you experience any technical difficulties during the webinar, please notify us through the chat interface and one of our support specialists will touch base. Lastly, a link to access the webinar recording will be sent to all registrants tomorrow, along with a survey link and supplemental resources from today's presentation. Now I am excited to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Anna Blankley is an assistant director of the University of British Columbia in the Michael Smith Laboratories and School of Biomedical Engineering. She completed a BS in chemical and biological engineering at the University of Colorado at Boulder, a PhD in bioengineering at University of Washington, and then a postdoctoral fellowship at Imperial College London under the supervision of Professor Robin Shattuck and Professor Molly Stevens. Her laboratory seeks to gain a better understanding of the immune mechanisms of RNA form formulations in order to design the next generation of vaccines and therapies. Welcome Anna and thank you so much for being here. I'm going to hand over the webinar controls to you now. Great. Thanks, Laurel, for the introduction. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and start. So thanks very much for the invitation. I'm really pleased to uh, be here with all of you CU people today. Um, and I'm going to talk about development of a self-amplifying RNA vaccine against COVID-19. So just to give you an outline of the presentation, I'm going to cover what is self-amplifying RNA for those of you who have never heard of it. I'll then talk about the development of the Imperial College London COVID-19 vaccine based off of self-amplifying RNA. I'll also go into the future of vaccine manufacturing and how I think this is going to change, as well as science communication around vaccines and confronting misinformation. So to start off, um, I thought I would give a little bit of background as, as Laurel indicated. I uh, got my chemical engineering degree from University of Colorado. I then went to do a PhD in bioengineering at the University of Washington in Seattle. And then I did a postdoc in an immunology lab in Robin Shattuck's lab um, at Imperial College London. And I am now an assistant professor at the University of British Columbia in the School of Biomedical Engineering and the Michael Smith Laboratories. I also wanted to point out that I actually am a third generation C Boulder grad. So um, my dad, my grandfather, and my aunt all graduated actually from the same program, chemical plus or minus biological engineering. I had just changed when I graduated. Um, and so, yeah, my grandfather graduated in 1955 and my dad and my aunt graduated in the 80s and I graduated in 2012. So I thought that was a fun detail I would share with everyone. So I like to start off by thinking about why do we even need new types of vaccines? We have lots that are already approved, um, and so why do we need to continue to come up with new types? So the first is really lack of efficacious treatment for many devastating infections like HIV. We've started to see in recent years the emergence of multi-drug resistant bacteria. We're always looking to improve the safety profile of already licensed vaccines. 
One that's very near and dear to us now is disease outbreaks. So how can we make vaccines quickly uh, when we discover a new pathogen? We also need to take into account the changing age structure of the population. So often elderly people don't respond to vaccines as, um, as younger people do. And we're also always looking to reduce the cost and time required to produce vaccines. So the research that I do really looks at being able to produce vaccines quickly in disease outbreaks, as well as reducing the cost and time required. So I wanna get into a little bit about the different types of vaccines for those who aren't as familiar in the field. So this is just a list of um, all the different types of vaccines that are possible. I'll also get into how they work and how that's different between these new RNA vaccines as well as more traditional vaccines. Um, but we typically split these into two different categories. So replicating vaccines and non-replicating vaccines. And you'll notice that there's two scales here. So safety and efficacy, and they go in uh, different directions. So you'll notice that the replicating vaccines like replicating vectors and live attenuated viruses are usually really highly efficacious, but may sometimes have some safety concerns. Whereas non-replicating vaccines like non-replicating viral vectors, inactivated viruses, virus like particles, protein subunit vaccines and nucleic acid vaccines um, are higher on the safety scale, but lower on the efficacy scale. So it's kind of always a balance of getting the safety and efficacy right for every vaccine. So what are nucleic acid vaccines or RNA vaccines? So I like to think about what is the goal of a vaccine? So the goal here is really to train your immune system to recognize a protein on the surface of a virus, such that if you ever encounter the virus, your body knows to attack it and neutralize it, which prevents you from getting infected. So we have a number of ways of introducing these viral proteins into your body. With a more traditional vaccine, like a protein vaccine, we would just make that protein protein um, in huge chemical reactors, we would and then directly inject that antigen protein into your body. For the new RNA vaccines, instead of uh, in introducing the protein, we use your cell's machinery to make the protein instead. So we give you, we instead we inject the RNA, uh, which gives your cells the code to make the protein yourself. So in a way we're using your cells as the bioreactor to make the protein. Um, so this is how these new RNA vaccines differ from more traditional protein or viral vector vaccines. So what is self-amplifying RNA? We're all now aware of the Pfizer and BioNTech and the Moderna vaccines, which are based off of messenger RNA. How messenger RNA works is that once the RNA gets into a cell, it engages with the ribosome and then your protein is translated. So for vaccines, this is your vaccine antigen. For self-amplifying RNA, there's a lot of steps, but stick with me. Basically, one strand of this RNA gets into your cell. It's able to um, be translate um, some antigen from that original strand, but it also encodes this replicase. So it encodes another protein, which is able to go back to the strand of RNA and make multiple copies of the RNA. And you can see from this that, you know, from one strand of RNA getting into the cells, you then end up with many strands of the RNA and thus much more antigen is translated. So what is the point of this? So this really just helps us to reduce the amount of RNA that we need to use. So why use self-amplifying RNA for vaccines compared to the other nucleic acids? So for those of you who haven't heard of these other ones, so there's really three different types of nucleic acids we can use for vaccines. So plasmid DNA, messenger RNA, and self-amplifying RNA. And you'll notice here that there's some structural differences between them. So plasmid DNA is a double-stranded and circular construct. Messenger RNA is more single-stranded and linear. And for self-amplifying RNA, um, it's very similar to messenger RNA, it's just a lot longer. So whereas mRNA is typically around 2000 nucleotides, self-amplifying RNA is actually closer to around 10,000 nucleotides, so it's huge. Compared to plasma DNA, it's much easier to deliver because it doesn't require penetration into the nucleus. Um, and from a safety perspective, there's also no risk of integration into the host genome. If you compare it to messenger um, RNA, as we saw on the previous slide, the self-amplifying property leads to exponentially more copies of the RNA once it's in the cell, and thus a lot higher protein expression. So we can really minimize the dose of the self-amplifying RNA that we need to use. <clears throat> 
So one of the questions um, that I often get is why do we need to, or can we use RNA itself or do we need to put it into some sort of formulation? So because RNA is a very large negatively charged molecule, the membranes of your cells are also negatively charged. So they repel each other. So we have to kind of neutralize that surface charge to, to get the RNA into the cells. And there's, there's really like a paradigm here of how we do this. So we take a solution of the negatively charged RNA. So it could be saRNA, it could also be messenger RNA. It's very similar. And then we take a delivery vehicle, um, which is positively charged. We combine these using a microfluidic system. And what we get out of it is usually particles with RNA on the inside of it that then have a neutral surface charge. So there's really three different types of um, delivery systems that we can use for this. I won't get too much into this today, but um, many of you may know that lipid nanoparticles are the most clinically advanced. This is what the Pfizer and uh, BioNTech and Moderna vaccines are both formulated in. Um, so just a little background on that. So this is more the type of research I do, the biomaterials of RNA delivery. Um, but as you know, over a year ago now, um, the, the COVID-19 outbreak was declared, declared a pandemic. So during my postdoctoral work, um, we then pivoted to focusing on making a COVID-19 vaccine, um, which I'll share with you now. So how do you actually make an RNA vaccine against SARS-CoV-2? When you're trying to make a brand new vaccine, you know, where do you even begin? So you start by taking, um, if this is the SARS-CoV-2 virus, um, there is a protein on the surface of it called the spike protein, um, which is very namely or aptly named because it looks like a spike on the surface of the virus. This is known to be the target for coronaviruses. Um, so for SARS and MERS, people had done research showing that this was the best antigen target for putting into a vaccine. Um, we take what's called the prefusion stabilized spike antigen. This is just a fancy way of saying we encode this spike antigen into our saRNA construct. So we make RNA. We, we then put those RNA into lipid particles and initially test it in, in animals in a mouse model. So one thing that I think is really cool to highlight is just how quickly we're able to make these vaccines. Um, so I'll go through our timeline um, and you know, other RNA vaccines were similarly fast. So on the 10th of January, the circulating strain of this novel coronavirus was published and made available to everybody. We accessed it on the 20th of January at Imperial College. We were then able to design our RNA and order the, the DNA and illegal, illegos, um, that are required for making our plasmid on the 22nd of January. We are then able to make our construct on the 28th of January. We confirmed in cells that we were getting expression from our saRNA vaccine on the 12th of February. So we then started our immunogenicity studies on the 13th of February. Um, we then studied or started our toxicology study in rats on the 30th of March and published or submitted our paper on the 22nd of April and then started our clinical trials on the 19th of June. So the point here is really that we went from just knowing the sequence of the virus to starting clinical trials in humans within six months. So these types of vaccines, because they're so quick to make, um, are just a lot faster than more traditional types of vaccines. So I wanted to get into a little bit of data. Um, this is all published and available to the public now, but I just wanted to show you how, how well these vaccines work. So I know there's a lot of different groups and, and data here, but I'll walk you all through it. So on the Y axis, we have the antibody titer. So this is the SARS-CoV-2 specific IgG. We analyze this by using an ELISA test. Um, our animals got an injection at zero and four weeks, so much like the normal RNA vaccine schedules. And there's a bunch of different groups down here. So um, the first one is electroporated DNA. This is just our standard positive control. We know it works really well every time, so we include that in all of our experiments. We then use a different antigen, so rabies, as a negative control to make sure that we're getting specific antibodies with our vaccine. We then use four different doses of our RNA vaccine. So 10 micrograms, 1, 0.1, and 0.01 micrograms. 
Um, and then because we were at the hospital, we were able to get serum from patients that had recovered from COVID-19 even very early on in the pandemic. So we're able to compare how all of these um, antibody titers were different. So what you can see here is we get a good response from our electroporated DNA as expected, about 10 to the fifth nanograms per mil. No response from our negative control indicating that the assay is sensitive and working. And a really nice dose response here from our four different uh, groups of RNA vaccines, so 10, 1, 0.1, and 0.01. And you can see that it goes down really nicely with the dose. Um, and what you'll also notice is that our, our top dose, 10 micrograms, is about an order of magnitude higher than even our electroporated DNA, which is kind of the standard of working really well. So they're really quite potent vaccines. Um, what's really important to notice here is that if you compare it to the patients who have recovered from COVID-19, even our lowest dose of 0.01 micrograms is induces a higher antibody titer um, than the antibody titer in those patients. Um, so what we conclude, conclude here is that it induces about a hundredfold higher antibody titer than a natural COVID-19 infection. So the second thing we want to look at is, so that's the quantity of antibodies, but how functional are those antibodies at what's called neutralizing the virus? So they're specific for that spike protein. How well do they uh, prevent the virus from uh, causing an infection? So to do this, we do a, an assay called a pseudovirus neutralization assay. Um, you can also use the wild type virus. They're very similar um, results and we have done them both and they're basically exactly correlated. So I'm showing you the pseudovirus neutralization today. Again, we have the same um, group. So the electroporated DNA, the rabies control are four doses of RNA and then the recovered COVID-19 patients. So this is expressed as an IC50. So the higher the IC50, the better. Again, we see about 10 to the third for the DNA, almost two orders of magnitude higher for our highest dose of RNA, the 10 micrograms up at 10 to the fifth. And again, a very nice dose response here. Um, so even down at our lowest level of 0.01 micrograms, we're still getting an IC50 of about 10 to the fourth. And that's about an order of magnitude higher than the neutralization level in the recovered COVID-19 patients. So we see that in, um, this RNA vaccine really enhances the neutralization compared to the natural infection. And so a way we can read this out is just by comparing the quantity versus the functionality of the antibodies. So we do this by comparing the ELISA results with the neutralization results. And it's separated here into our mice and our recovered COVID-19 human patients. And you can see that in both cases, the increasing antibody titers also increases the neutralization. So they're positively correlated, um, which is a good indication that you know, you're making functional antibodies that they're not off target or something like that. So the last thing we look at when we're characterizing a vaccine is what's called the cellular response. So at the end of a study, we take splenocytes, so cells in the spleen, and take them out. We re-stimulate them with the spike protein and then look at how much interferon gamma they're secreting. So this is just an activating cytokine. Um, so we, this is expressed in, so this is an LA spot assay and it's expressed in spot forming units per million splenocytes. So it, this really just means what number of those splenocytes were expressing interferon gamma when they were re-stimulated. So you can see here with the electroporated DNA, it's at about 250 spot forming units per million splenocytes. And this might look like a really bad response, but this is actually a typical response for DNA and actually usually considered a pretty good response. Um, the reason it looks so low is just, it's really eclipsed by how well the RNA vaccines perform. So you can see with our highest doses of the, uh, the RNA formulated in lipid nanoparticles, we're actually seeing about 2,500 spot forming units per million splenocytes, um, which is about 10 times higher than the DNA. And we, you know, again, a really nice dose response curve. We still see good cellular responses with our lowest dose. So this tells us that in addition to the antibodies that we're also getting really good cellular immunity from, from these vaccines. So um, one of the questions that I get all the time now is where is the ICL RNA vaccine now? So we finished our phase one, two combined clinical trial in January. Um, by that point, I'm sure many of you may have heard, the UK is doing very well with the vaccine distribution. And so um, because we are an academic you know, team, 
uh, we were funded mainly by the government. And so at that point, the government made the decision not to use 130 million pounds, which is the cost of doing a phase three trial um, because they already had approved vaccines. So the team has now pivoted to focusing on the different mutations um, and also actually looking at combining with different types of vaccines like the Oxford vaccine to look at boosting other vaccines. Um, but that being said, we I am co-founder of a company called Vax Equity, um, which is looking at harnessing this technology to make vaccines. So I don't think we've seen the end of SARNA vaccines. Um, the last part that I wanted to talk to is just about is just really how do we make vaccines and why are RNA vaccines so different? So this is, these are some pictures of how we make um, more traditional type of vaccines like protein vaccines and viral vexors. And this is a photo from 1957 of making the flu vaccine, uh, which is made in eggs. And this is a photo from 2021 um, of making the flu vaccine. So we still make it in eggs. It's a very archaic technology um, and very manual, right? Like each of those eggs has to be individually handled by a human and it's just not very high throughput. For other um, vaccines like protein and viral vector vaccines, they require these huge bioreactors to be able to grow up the cells that um, then produce the protein or the viruses um, and then which then need to be purified. So they require huge amounts of um, resources and space to make these vaccines, which is one of the major limitations. However, for RNA vaccines, because it's a completely synthetic process, um, i.e. it doesn't depend on cells, we're actually able to make a, a million doses in a volume of 100 milliliters. So we can make this really easily in the lab, um, whereas you know, making these other uh, vaccines, it takes a lot more resources and time. Um, so this is this is one of the reasons why I think, you know, we're now really kind of in an RNA vaccine revolution. Um, it's just because the technology is, is much easier to make at a large scale. Um, so one thing that a thought experiment that I, I did recently that I think is really interesting and kind of puts this all into perspective is thinking about how many Olympic sized swimming pools it would take to vaccinate the entire world with an RNA vaccine. So I did these calculations specifically for the Pfizer and BioNTech vaccine. So the assumption I made is that there's 7.7 .7 billion people in the world. Uh, they each need two doses of the vaccines, which comes to a total of 15.4 billion doses. Each dose of the vaccine is 0 0.3 milliliters. So the total required volume of vaccines is 4.62 million liters. Each Olympic swimming pool is 2.5 million liters, which comes out to a total of two Olympic swimming pools. So to some people, this seems like a lot. To some people, this seems like a little. To me, it seems like a little. And I think just really puts into perspective what like the volume of vaccines we need for the entire world is actually quite feasible, whereas for some of the other vaccines, um, it's, it's a lot more than that. So I like to ponder too, just, you know, the future of uh, vaccine manufacturing and how I think this will change um, for, you know, normal vaccines, but also in future pandemics. So just to tell you our story, uh, when we were manufacturing our vaccines, there's only certain places in the world that do this. So we got our RNA from California. Um, our lipids actually came from a company in Vancouver in Canada. They were both shipped to a company in Austria to be formulated. Uh, and then that formulation was sent to Italy to be put into vials and then back to the UK to be used in our clinical trials. So you can see that this was a whole really logistical nightmare, um, but there are very few places now that have all of the infrastructure to make all of these different components, although I think that will change in the future. So because, you know, you, I showed um, a few slides ago that RNA vaccines have such a lower required volume for the manufacturer, I think instead in the future, we'll start to see um, more independent and small vaccine manufacturing centers that can serve a local population or a few local countries, as opposed to these huge centers, which are located in only a few places worldwide at this moment. So um, the research that, that I plan on doing from here on out. I just started my lab at University of British Columbia. 
And to me, you know, the plane is really off the ground. Um, it's It's been awesome to get so much momentum in the field of RNA vaccines. As many of you know, um, that was the first phase three trials that were done for RNA vaccines last year. And so before that, we didn't really know if they were going to work. So in my view, the plane is really off the ground. But I think there's lots of ways that we can continue to make these uh, vaccines better. So thinking about how can we engineer these RNA molecules to be even better and produce even more protein per RNA molecule. Thinking about what are the best biomaterials, what's the best formulation to get these RNA to the cells or the tissues that they need to be in. As well as thinking about how do we make already existing vaccines better or apply this to other applications. So one really good example is the flu vaccine, which in a good year is 30 to 40% effective. Part of the reason for that is that um, we have to decide in February of each year what strains we're going to put into the, the uh, virus or into the vaccine for that year um, so that it can be manufactured and distributed in October. And so that six month you know, lag time uh, is, is quite a setback. And so you can imagine having a winter flu season where um, you know, with the amount of time it takes to make RNA vaccines, maybe you have three or four flu vaccines that are available throughout the winter, which should hopefully then also stop the spread of it. Um, I also aim to uh, gain a better understanding of the immune response, as well as look at using RNA for other therapeutic indications, such as expressing monoclonal antibodies. Um, so the last, the last part of my presentation today is just really thinking about science communication, um, which I'm really passionate about, uh, specifically concerning vaccine hesitancy. So, you know, I always tell this to people that there's no point in making it a vaccine if there's nobody that wants to take it, right? So this is a graph um, that was produced by Heidi Larson's lab, who's really um, just been kind of a champion of vaccine hesitancy and has been studying it for over the past decade. So you can see here that there's a lot of countries that believe that um, vaccines are important, but the lag really falls off between being believing that vaccines are effective and that vaccines are safe. So I'm really interested in understanding like what is the missing link between believing that that vaccines are important, but not, that they're not safe or effective. Um, so this is why I think public engagement is really important. So the pace of science is just not matched by the pace of public communication. So for example, um, as of January 2020, so at the beginning of last year, there were a lot of scientists that didn't even know what a RNA vaccine was, right? But now millions of people have gotten them. And so of course, people are going to have lots of questions when this technology, this type of RNA vaccine hasn't really reached the zeitgeist yet. So I was recruited to an organization called Team Halo, which started as a collaboration between the United Nations and the Vaccine Confidence Project. And the whole goal here is to connect scientists and clinicians that are working on COVID-19 to the general public um, with the goal of improving vaccine literacy and confidence over TikTok. And I know that's very counterintuitive to think about doing it over TikTok, um, but I'm here to convince you that it's not just a platform for dancing teenagers. So I started uh, making vaccine videos about you know, vaccine hesitancy and education starting in October of last year as a part of Team Halo. So they helped me to learn how to do it, which is great. Um, and it seems very counterintuitive, but I will say that I think it's a really elegant platform that you can show people in the lab how we test vaccines and make them um, and also directly confront misinformation. So I've had a, um, a unprecedented amount of <laughs> success for a scientist, I think. So I have over 200,000 followers now, but I think this really goes to show just how much of a hunger there is for this information out there. Um, and it's a really great opportunity to engage with people. And I think part of the reason for this is that the videos are really short. And so it offers um, a really palatable amount of information. You know, it's not like an hour long lecture or something like today, it's a 15 or 60 second video where people get a short snippet of information and that's much more digestible. Uh, so the other really fun part about it is I think it's a great opportunity to put a face to the name of all these scientists who are behind these COVID-19 vaccines. So I recently had some big names on my TikTok. So Peter Cullis, who really is the founding father of 
uh, lipid nanoparticles who started a company here in, in Vancouver called Acuitis, um, who formulated the Pfizer and BioNTech vaccines, as well as the Imperial and CureVac vaccines, um, which is really awesome, as well as Bob Langer, who is a co-founder of Moderna. And if you can see the comments over here, they're really quite nice. Um, it was very heartwarming. And so you can see they say like, thank you for all your hard work, so grateful for you. And it's, made, it's really made me realize, you know, people appreciate scientists, they just don't have any idea who they are. And so part of my mission is to make more scientists household names so that we really have this connection between scientists and, you know, society, the people that end up benefiting from their years of work. So with that, um, just to recap my conclusions here. So we saw that with our self-amplifying RNA vaccine, uh, it induces higher antibody titers and neutralization than a natural infection from, um, in recovered COVID-19 patients. We completed our phase one and two trial in January and are now targeting mutations and boosters um, with our company called Vax Equity. And in the future, I think this modular manufacturing of RNA vaccines will really enable a global response um, to future outbreaks that will just continue to get faster than, than this one even was. Um, so with that, I'd like to acknowledge all the people that were involved in this work. So Robin Shattuck and all my colleagues at Imperial College, as well as uh, Wendy Barkley and her uh, students and postdocs, as well as our collaborators at Acuitas in Vancouver. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you, Anna. As a reminder, if you have any questions, please submit them through the Q&A interface at the bottom of your screen. Our first question comes from Mark. Um, two questions about the mRNA. Mm -hmm. Does the strand persist after it passed through the ribosome? If so, what mechanism eventually breaks down the RNA? And second, if RNA only travels from the nucleus out, how are the nucleic acids resupplied to the nucleus. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, so for your first question, so how does it, how long does it persist? So yeah, presumably every strand of RNA um, engages actually with multiple ribosomes. For, so for those who aren't familiar, the ribosome is what engages with the RNA and then produces a protein from that strand of RNA. And so um, yeah, most commonly, it will actually produce multiple proteins from a string, single strand of RNA. So it is eventually decayed. Uh, so your, you know, your body has actually evolved all these mechanisms to, um, I guess, decay foreign RNA because that's what a lot of viruses are made of, right? So your body is actually really sophisticated at detecting foreign RNAs and decaying it. So for most messenger RNA, it's um, it goes away within three to five days. Um, and so that's usually degraded by endonucleases or RNases. Um, for, and I'm not quite sure I'm understanding the question about uh, resupplying the nucleotides, um, but those are you know, constantly being made by your cells so that those are the building blocks um, of you know, messenger RNA in, in your cells. So they're constantly being replenished. Thank you, Anna. Um, our next question comes from Brad. Why do people still get COVID after taking the vaccine? Yeah, so it is possible that people get COVID after taking the vaccine, although we've seen um, with most of these vaccines, you know, they are very good at pre preventing disease. So I guess there's a couple aspects to this. So when you get a vaccine, um, you start to see antibodies two weeks after getting it, but you're not considered fully protected until two weeks after your second vaccination. So this means that there's still quite a long window where you could have gotten the vaccine and then be exposed to COVID and get COVID. Um, they're also not 100% effective. You know, with the RNA vaccines, we see that they're over 94% effective, um, which is really good. But that, that actually, um, from the clinical trials, is usually against severe COVID-19, which was just uh, how the trials were designed. And so it is still possible that you may get it, um, but it, you know, they do seem to be really effective at preventing it. Thank you, Anna. Um, our next question comes from Kurt. What's the LGG response in a patient who has had SARS vax after having the infection? I'm not sure what the LGG response is. So yeah, I'm not sure I can answer that question. Okay. 
Um, next question is when we didn't respond well to the MERS and SARS pandemics years ago with improved VAX technology, it left us exposed with the SARS COVID-2. Will we be wiser this time and use the SARNA tech and be ready for the next wave or next pandemic? Yeah, I actually think the vaccine technology, even from both SARS and MERS, has improved quite a bit, which is the reason we even have approved vaccines now. So um, the, the mRNA, the development of them is, is very similar. It's the same timeline, basically. So I think the benefit that we would get from using the SARNA is just that we'd be able to minimize the dose and then also, you know, be able to produce a higher number of vaccines in a shorter time. So I think, I do think that will start to come online, but I think another really important thing to consider is that, um, all that research that people did on SARS and MERS vaccines was, wasn't for nothing. So the reason that we were able to make these vaccines so quickly was because we knew what target to use in the vaccines. You know, if you can imagine um, getting the, the sequence of the viral genome in January, it's basically just this document of letters. And so you have to be able to decipher out of that, what is the protein on the surface of it? And we are only able to do that because people had done so much to study SARS and MERS and then make vaccines for them and know which protein um, would, would be used as the for the vaccine. So, um, you know, we've built upon that. And I think it's just, people might not know that, but actually all that research that was done for SARS and MERS vaccines really enabled us to have, you know, approved vaccines within a year of a pandemic occurring, which is actually quite amazing. Thank you, Anna. Um, and I got clarification. So I'm gonna go back to the last question. So what's the IgG response in a patient who has had SARS vax after having the infection? I see. Um, so the IgG response is the antibody response, which is, is what we also quantified using our ELISA. So we see that um, for most of these vaccines, and these are kind of constantly being updated for all the different vaccines, but um, usually with COVID-19, people have like quite a range of responses, whether they have a mild or moderate or severe disease. And so the IgG response will vary depending on the severity of disease. Whereas for the vaccines, um, it induces you know, pretty much similar immune responses and IgG responses in most patients. And so um, for all the vaccines that have been approved thus far, these are way higher than the, the IgG response that you get from a natural infection. Thanks for clarifying. Thank you, Anna. Um, our next question comes from Bill. How is a 10,000 base SARNA strand made synthetically? Is strand um, for math, uh, is strand chemistry used? No, so we don't make it um, by like a chemical synthesis method. It's actually made using a DNA template. And then we have an enzyme called RNA polymerase that basically walks along that DNA template and produces a strand of RNA. So um, this is why it's called synthetically because you basically just add all the ingredients into a tube and incubate it for two hours and then your RNA is produced. Great. Thank you, Anna. Um, our next question is, is there any risk of long-term side effects from mRNA vaccines? Yeah, so this is a great question. And I get this asked this all the time on TikTok. So from what we've seen now, you know, people in the clinical trials, um, so far, it's kind of I guess, short and midterm side effects that we know about. Um, and we continue to monitor all the people that are part of the clinical trials, but also patients who get the approved vaccines. Um, so we haven't observed any sort of, you know, long-term side effects from these vaccines thus far. And something that I think um, is really important to point out is that we've actually been using RNA vaccines in clinical trials since 2013, the first one was done. So we do actually have like quite a long history for the safety profile of RNA vaccines in people. If there was any sort of long-term effect um, that was associated with those vaccines, then we, it, you know, it would have been flagged. 
Um, and so, you know, they're not exactly the same vaccines, but they have basically the exact same ingredients, you know, it's RNA and four different lipids. And so um, we can kind of glean from this information that they should have very similar side effects. Thank you. Um, our next question comes from Deborah. What is the off mechanism for SARNA after introduction into the cell? Yeah, this is a great question. And lots of people always ask about this as well, because it's, um, you know, scary to think about that starts replicating and there's nothing to turn it off. So uh, basically, there's a balance between the replication of RNA and the rate of decay of RNA, just like for normal messenger RNA, um, it's being decayed, it's just also being produced. And at some point, the RNA is just degraded more quickly than it can replicate. And so usually this means between 30 and 60 days, it's able to replicate for, um, but actually the exact mechanism of why the decay eventually overcomes the replication isn't completely understood. Um, so yeah. Thank you. Um, our next question comes from Chet and it's around getting vaccinated if you've already had COVID. Um, so should the timing or amount of vaccine be adjusted for those who've already had COVID? Yeah, so right now the recommendation is that you do get a vaccine. They've been shown um, in people that have recovered from COVID to boost the antibody response, which is really important. So they do work in people that have had COVID. Um, it's And yeah, it's really not possible to change the dose of the vaccine. That's a very standardized thing that comes from the clinical trial. So um, when they do those tests on people that have gotten COVID and then get the vaccine, they use a, the standard dose that was used for all the other participants. Um, and so that's that's the dose that you would get. But um, that's, yeah, from the studies that have been published, that seems to work quite well. Thank you, Anna. Um, our next question comes from Casey. Do you foresee flu vaccines becoming RNA-based and vaccinating for coronavirus variants becoming a part of yearly flu vaccines? Yeah, I would love for the flu vaccine to become an RNA vaccine. I think it's just, it's such an archaic technology and anybody who um, has any allergies to eggs can't get the normal flu vaccine. And so I think it's just, you know, a target. I don't think RNA vaccines will necessarily take over like all the approved vaccines, but I think that's a really easy target. Um, you know, there's all of these centers all over the world that are constantly monitoring the strains of flu that are going around. And so we could could really easily be making RNA vaccines for those. So I think that's one of the kind of next steps after, after the pandemic. Um, as far as an annual COVID-19 vaccine, this is still really up in the air. So it depends on a few different things. So it depends on how long your antibody responses last for. So, you know, do they last for one year? Do they last for five years? Do they last for 10 years? We don't know and we can't know until that time passes really, right? Um, but that's, you know, why we continue to monitor people. And the other point that you brought up is the different variants. So, you know, is there, are there going to be variants where these vaccines aren't as useful against them? Um, it's possible, but really, you know, it's not, it's not as we've seen from the data, you know, of all the variants thus far, it's not a binary, like any vaccine that's, you know, 94% effective against one strain doesn't become 0% effective against one strain, it might just be slightly less effective. So I think we'll have to see, you know, how quickly we're able to distribute vaccines around the globe, how many mutations come up, and then it's very possible that we just may need a booster shot maybe annually or um, possibly less frequently than that to account for any sort of mutations that become prevalent. Thank you. Um, our next question is the chart that compares uh, Tiers of antibodies between vaccinated and recovered COVID-19 people shows that some of the latter had no antibodies. Is this evidence that some people fight off infection without antibodies? Um, no. So there's kind of a caveat there. So all of those people that um, in our cohort were people that were hospitalized for COVID-19 infection. So they had really severe infections, actually. The problem um, with that is that when we were getting them, we didn't have um, information about the time from their infection to when that sample was taken. So some people presumably had longer stays. Yeah. <laughs> 
And the real question there is, so IgG actually usually takes two weeks to come online. So it's usually two weeks after your infection that you start to see those antibody responses. So presumably some of them just had low antibody responses when, when they were sampled. Um, so it's a little bit tricky to say. I think we know now, like there's been lots of studies on this since you know those, those samples were almost a year ago now, possibly even more. Um, so we have a better understanding of people responding to a an actual infection. And some people do have low antibody responses, but it doesn't necessarily correlate with the severity of disease. Thank you, Anna. Our next question comes from Karen. How does this differ from the Norovax vaccine or Novavax, excuse me? Hmm. So Novavax is a protein vaccine. Um, so instead of using RNA, they just directly inject the protein that they um, produce in cells. Great, thank you. Our next question comes from Deanna. Can you provide input on why patients who have had COVID tend to have stronger reactions to the vaccine than those who were never infected? Yeah, I'm not sure. I think this is being studied right now. Um, I think it depends on which vaccine you get, right? So, you know, there's RNA vaccines like the Pfizer and BioNTech and Moderna, as well as viral vector vaccines like the Johnson and Johnson and AstraZeneca. So I haven't seen any data on as to the mechanism behind that. Thank you, Anna. Our next question comes from Chuck. I have friends who are likely to not get vaccinated because they fear what might show up for them unintended consequences in a few decades from the vaccine. Do they have good reason to fear or be cautious? Yeah, so I think it's it's actually really important for people to think about all of the side effects and definitely consider for yourself whether it's right to get a vaccine. Um, I think as far as the long-term side effects, so going back to what I was saying earlier about, you know, I think everybody gets kind of, or some people get scared hearing that this is like a relatively new technology. I think scientists are always really excited, like, oh, we have this new technology and it's all relative, right? Like, yeah, it's new compared to producing flu vaccines and eggs, which we've had for, you know, like 60 years now, um, but it's actually not that new. So we, the first RNA vaccine was actually made in 1990. That was the first time somebody showed that you could use RNA as a vaccine. So they've been studied for decades now. And the first RNA vaccine, um, as I said, was used in a clinical trial in 2013. So as part of any normal clinical trial protocol, um, you have to monitor those people. And so if they're if there were any long-term side effects associated with them, we would know by now. Um, and because they're a very similar formulation, you know, these lipid nanoparticles and RNA, um, I think it, you know, that's what gives me the confidence to think that the side effects or the long-term effects aren't going to be any different. Thank you, Anna. Our next question is, does a replicating RNA vaccine enter cells over the entire body? Is there a chance that the RNA might replicate in the brain and lead to an immune attack there? Um, so that's a good question. So as far as the biodistribution, you know, you get a an injection in your muscle. So it definitely um, enters some of the cells in your muscle. And the only other place we really ever see this RNA go is to the lymph nodes. So they're in particles and some of those particles will drain via your lymphatics to the lymph node, which is actually where we think the most potent immune response goes to. So I have never heard of anybody detecting um, any sort of RNA expression in the brain after intramuscular injection. It's like an incredibly difficult barrier to cross. And there's, you know, whole fields of research trying to target that. Um, so yeah, no, most of the time the biodistribution is just in the muscle and the lymph node. Thank you. Our next question comes from Allison. Similarly to how we predict influenza variants every year, can we predict future SARS COVID variants to include in our flu shots? P.S. I love your TikTok account. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, I think, you know, we're getting better at understanding these flu variants, but that's kind of one of the reasons that the flu vaccine still isn't great is because it's really hard to predict what 
variant is going to be going around. Um, and so that's why I think as opposed to, you know, kind of one of the strategies in the meantime, before we get all of the, you know, like AI and machine learning to be able to predict these things really well, is to just cut down on that production time so that we can be responding to the variants in a better time, um, as opposed to, you know, a month long lead time. Um, so I think there's there's another idea which is kind of like a universal flu vaccine and you could imagine the same thing for a universal covid vaccine which is that you have some sort of target which induces antibodies that um, neutralize all the different variants so people have been studying this for flu for years like we don't have one yet but there, there's there's a lot of different strategies to think about okay so what's what's a vaccine that you somebody could get that then would protect them from all the different variants in the future so that's another you know very active area of research right now thank you anna our next question comes from Jenny, and it's a fun question. Um, what scientist would be your dream to do a TikTok with? <laughs> well, Bob Langer already was a dream, so <laughs> I think I've I've accomplished that. But there's so many people um, that have contributed to this. Yeah, I'm like it's one of the things I really love using my platform for is there's all these amazing scientists that have done years of work that had led us to have these technologies. Um, so yeah, I have I have a couple of fun ones coming up, but I'm not going to divulge them. Thank you, Anna. Our next question comes from Mark. When talking to people with vaccine hesitancy, I sometimes they say that they heard the vaccine will change their DNA. What's a good way to talk them about talk to them about why that can't happen? Yeah, so there's kind of two parts of this actually. So as far as the DNA, um, you know, RNA once it's delivered to your cell, it doesn't enter the nucleus. It's not good at getting past that barrier. Um, it's a whole other nuclear membrane. So it has this negative charge. So again, it's repelled by that. Um, so yeah, your body has really like efficient mechanisms for making sure that RNA isn't getting into your nucleus. Um, so it's, it's really just not possible for the RNA to um, alter your DNA because it's not getting into the nucleus. Um, so just keep that in mind. That's kind of the technical question to it. Doesn't get into the nucleus. Um, but another thing that I've really found with people who are vaccine hesitant or, you know, are thinking about not getting the vaccine is ju mostly just trying to understand, like, I think a lot of the time it comes from fear and misunderstanding. And so I always try to approach it as, as, you know, trying to educate people about the vaccines as opposed to convince them to getting it. Because I think as soon as anybody senses that you're trying to convince them to get it, um, they just feel like digging their heels in and it just makes them even more opposed to it. And so I think you just, you know, go in with an open mind and try to understand like, what is the real fear here? I think people often have really complicated and, you know, very valid reasons they don't want to get vaccines. And I think it's important to try and understand that as well. Thank you, Anna. Our next question is, we are a class of high school seniors in a biomedical academy. What jobs do you see being in high demand due to the pandemic? Yeah, I, first of all, it's a really cool school that you go to. I don't think anything like that existed when I was in school, but that's awesome. Um, and yeah, I think the, the job landscape is really changing. So I think now even there's a shortage of people who know how to um, design RNA, make these RNA vaccines, um, and the actual, you know, like chemical engineering processes that you would use to scale these up. There's not very many people around the world that do that. But I think another side to it that's really important for kind of like any aspect is the bioinformatics. So, you know, being able to sequence the variants um, and understand how the sequences are changing over time is a really good one. Um, and yeah, being able to do kind of that, the bioinformatics side of it where um, you, yeah, you can kind of like handle the big data sets and stuff like that. I think that's going to just continue to be more and more important in the future. Thank you, Anna. Our next question is, do you envision this type of technology for a vaccine being used for a potential HIV vaccine? 
Yeah, it's possible. That's actually the, the project that I started at Imperial was using self-amplifying RNA for an HIV vaccine. So the major challenge with HIV is that the rate of mutation is so, so fast that it's really hard to make a vaccine that, um, you know, we all know now. So with the, all the variants of COVID, it's hard to make a vaccine that is effective against all of them. So the rate of mutation for HIV is way faster than COVID. So, you know, for example, a patient that, you know, presumably gets infected with one HIV virum, by the next day, they have thousands of different strains within them. And so that's, that's one of the most difficult aspects to it. I think the platform would work well for it. We just need to know the protein target better. So what people look for there is um, what's called broadly neutralizing antibodies. So it's antibodies that are generated that neutralize all the different types of HIV. So that's kind of the breakthrough that needs to happen. Um, and then I think actually lots of different platforms would work for HIV vaccines. Thank you, Anna. Our next question is, I'm concerned about the safety for my children. Is there any concern that this type of vaccine could alter future f fertility? Yeah, great question. Um, I would be as well. I think so now, you know, now that it's approved for certain age groups, it's either above 18 or above 16 for some of the vaccines. They have started doing pediatric pediatric clinical trials. So the reason they don't do these first is um, they take, you know, kind of these normal cohorts normally of 18 to 55 year olds. And that's, you know, the, I guess what they consider to be representative of the general population. Um, so after that's shown to be safe and effective, then they move on to what's considered more vulnerable subsets like pediatrics or pregnant women, for example. So they did recently show that the vaccine um, was safe and effective in 12 to 15 year olds, I think they'll continue to look at different age groups. Um, and going back to yeah, what I was saying about kind of these long term effects of RNA vaccines, um, I think it's very unlikely that they will have any effect on fertility. I think if that was the case, we would have seen that um, in kind of two different ways. So we would have seen it from clinical trials that have been going on for eight years now, um, as well as just in the general population, right? So, you know, we've had these vaccines and the clinical trials started over a year ago. So if there was any sort of effect on fertility, you would actually also see that in the general population, given that now millions of people have been given RNA vaccines. Um, so I get it's a really tricky subject. Um, I'm, I guess I'm comforted by the fact that they're, they're doing Doing these clinical trials in children now, and it's you know a lot better to be able to rely on the data. Thank you, Anna. Um, we're going to move into our final two questions. So our first one comes from Rosemary. Does ninety-five percent uh, effective translate to five out of a hundred getting no protection? Yeah, so this is a great question and a common misconception. So the way they calculate that is it's actually the relative risk. So they take the number of cases in the placebo placebo group of the phase three trial and compare it to the number of cases in the vaccinated group. And that's where they get the 95% risk reduction. So it's not like 95% of people, it's a 95% reduction in risk of COVID-19 infection. Thank you, Anna. Our last question is, how will the development of this technology better equipped humanity to handle the next emerging virus? Yeah, so I think now that we have um, these, you know, what's called platform technologies, I think it, it really enables us to make vaccines a lot more quickly. Um, and now that we know they work, um, it's really promising. I think the, another thing to consider is that, you know, it may not be like the holy grail of vaccines. It is possible that there's RNA vaccines that wouldn't work against a certain type of pathogen, which is why it's important to have other options as well. Um, so, you know, basically RNA vaccines can work for any um, pathogen that has a protein target, but it's possible that a pathogen wouldn't have a protein target. For example, a bacteria that might have like a, a glycosylated protein, which would then have a different um, structure to it, which, you know, RNA can't make. So 
Um, I think it is a really good tool in our toolkit, um, but it's also important to have other options um, just in case there are different types of pathogens that arrive in the future. Thank you, Anna. And thank you so much to everyone joining us for today's presentation. I wanna give another thank you to Anna for this great information. At this time, we invite you to provide your feedback on the webinar by answering the following poll question. On a scale from one to 10, how likely are you to recommend this webinar to a friend or other CU Boulder alumni? We thank you in advance for submitting your feedback um, for submitting your feedback, as a reminder, all webinar attendees will receive an email tomorrow with a link to the recording of this presentation as well as a survey. To view upcoming webinars as well as previous recordings, please visit our website at www.colorado.edu backslash business backslash alumni. We hope you will join us for our next webinar, which is tomorrow as Ed Van Wessup and Brian Waters presents on why GameStop, why now, a theory of all in investors and unstable asset prices. In the meantime, have a great rest of your day. Thank you for your time and go Buffs. <laughs>